We're going to continue on with this lecture to talk a little bit about development in India and the Green Revolution in particular. So one of the major historical features that has impacted development is British imperialism. So as, we, as we've seen in other parts of the world, um, early British and uh, European contact is based on just uh, the establishment of trading outposts in the late 1600s, and it wasn't until the 1770s that British began colonial rule. This period of time is called the Raj, and within that, um, you had a lot of different things that happen. Um, the area that we think of today as India, Pakistan, um, and Bangladesh uh, has a lot of different um, ethnic groups, a lot of different um, sort of small kingdoms that were united under British rule uh, that were um, in the process. There was a lot of social reforms that took place, building of infrastructure, um, institution of uh, British cultural things like the university, um, English as a major language, uh, the switch of local industrial or local agriculture to plantations for export like we'd seen in other parts of the world. One of the major crops that this agriculture was built around was tea, was introduced to Europe uh, from Japan and China and became extremely popular. Um, the expertise on how to grow it was actually very heavily guarded in China and the British smuggled plants out of China and established plantations uh, for growing tea in um, South Asia. Um, the Suez Canal eventually sort of helps speed transport of these types of commodities back to Europe. So the Suez Canal um, is in uh, Southwest Asia that connects um, the sort of Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean, so that really helped to speed transport. And some of the names that are associated with this history are uh, names like George Lipton, which you still see as a major um, player in terms of Lipton tea as a major brand today. In the late 1800s, uh, Indians were beginning to organize to try to become independent of British rule. The Indian National Congress Party formed with the idea of promoting greater democracy and freedom from British and then also the traditional princes that had ruled uh, different kingdoms throughout the area. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi is uh, one of the major names associated with the nonviolent uh, movement to try to uh, earn the freedom of India from British rule. Um, the, this eventually happened and with independence became came the partition of India into different countries that were based on um, ethnic and religious divisions. Um, so you have the majority Hindu populations in some areas but very sizable um, Muslim minorities in other areas. So the partition was then based along these ethnic and religious lines. So the Islamic administrative district that was formed was uh, Pakistan and what we think of as Pakistan today in the West, there was West Pakistan and East Pakistan which is now um, Bangladesh. The different principalities as uh, the sort of smaller uh, administrative areas within India got to uh, make a decision based on the, who was the prince that was ruling that particular area. They decided whether their district would go um, with Pakistan or with uh, India. And um, so one of the regions that still is a site of conflict is Kashmir, that's a majority uh, Islamic area, but had a Hindu prince who made the decision to stay with India. So you have a majority Muslim population um, within this place and still continued tension between Pakistan and um, India about this particular area. I'm going to include a link to a video that looks at some of the things that happened with the partition and explains uh, some of the points of view of folks who were living there through uh, that process. So here you see um, the partition with West Pakistan, which is currently Pakistan, East Pakistan, which would become Bangladesh um, and India. 
So there was major consequences of independence and partition. So with this uh, sudden creation of different countries based on ethnic groups, you had um, some people who were, say, the Muslim minority living in India that all of a sudden, you know, wanted to make their way to Pakistan where they could be in the Islamic minority or places where there was a Hindu minority in Pakistan who wanted to move to India. Um, so you had the largest refugee movement ever recorded um, taking place from this partition. As that happened, there was a lot of fighting among the different groups as they passed and um, many, many lives that were uh, lost in the process. Um, eventually, East Pakistan, uh, what would become Bangladesh, fights for independence, and India actually helps them out in that process in the 1970s. Um, and Pakistan and India continue to fight over Kashmir. Both um, have a lot of you know, tensions about uh, borders. There's a lot of mistrust of each other, and both are uh, nuclear powers currently. These maps show uh, the shifting of the Muslim population within India, in India by states from 1931 uh, to 1991. So in the top left corner in 1931, you see that about 11% of the total population in India um, is Muslim. By 1951, you see some shifting of that as folks are moving out. And by 1991, um, you see shifting where you have you know, majority populations in uh, northern India and Kashmir um, and along the northern part of India near Nepal as well. So very, very much a sizable minority population in most of India, but particularly in those areas. In terms of population, then, India is the world's largest democracy. It has the 10th largest industrial sector in the world. Uh, they opened up the economy to uh, reforms in the early 1990s and have had tremendous growth with a rapidly growing middle class, about 300 million folks uh, making up that middle class. So that's almost as many folks as live in the United States total just being part of the Indian middle class. So these folks are highly educated and sophisticated consumers. In contrast, you still have massive poverty, about 390 million folks still living in poverty, a lot of them in rural areas, and then also a lot in urban slums as well. Other countries in Southern Asia not doing as well as uh, India, but the region does have some different associations for regional cooperation, so some supranational organizations to help try to coordinate trade and the economy. India is another part of the world that has um, very large populations, uh, 1.3 billion people, uh, the second largest, uh, second to China. Um, this population is, um, unlike China, not stabilizing but still quickly growing. Um, there's a lot of high densities of population, so many people per uh, square kilometer. If you look on the map here on the right, the areas in the darkest red have more than a thousand persons per square kilometer. So you can see, especially along uh, the northern part of the country, you have um, high population densities. These are the areas that have good agricultural regions um, along rivers and in coastal areas. Most of the population is rural, but there are 50 cities that have more than a million people uh, living in them. If we look at the population profile for India, uh, you can see here on the right uh, that population pyramid, and it is much more of the traditional pyramid that shows us that the population is rapidly uh, continuing to grow. Just as a comparison, we have the uh, population pyramid for Japan that's much more uh, stabilized, if not declining. Within India, there's been a lot of concern about overpopulation, population growth, and um, what happens as urban residents move into the cities. Um, resources are already severely taxed in terms of some environmental resources, in terms of uh, folks uh, living in slums within the cities. Um, so India began a population control policy in the 1950s. Um, to try to slow down population growth. Um, 
this has a pretty bad record overall and a lot of uh, distrust by uh, the everyday population because it relied on coercive type um, ways to motivate people. So uh, forcing people into having vasectomies, uh, having it based on uh, punishment of folks. So there's still a lot of distrust for family planning programs within India. Also, the country is very patriarchal, so you have, again, um, men favored over women, and um, women, um, when women are more educated, have higher status, and have wealth, they tend to have lower birth rates. So one of the emphasis, emphases has been on trying to educate women as a way to reduce overall birth rates and population growth. So if we think about that contrast between poor and rich within India, the middle class is able to live a life of uh, mass consumption similar to um, folks in the middle class in the West. So um, you know, major shopping centers, um, major consumption of things like movies. India has the largest movie industry in the world. You may have seen um, Bollywood movies as a particular sort of style of movies. Um, in India, and a lot of uh, Indian culture has been exported to uh, the rest of the world, so things like yoga, Indian food, that sort of thing, as uh, being things we often see in the West associated with South Asian culture. When we think about uh, this development, we can also uh, take gender into consideration. So um, with the sort of lower status of women and uh, less access to education, you have um, women experiencing uh, poverty uh, disproportionately and having to care for uh, children and work at the same time. One of the things we read about earlier in the quarter um, when we talked about Latin America was this notion of the Green Revolution, so especially tied to fears about uh, overpopulation in the 1950s, efforts were made to uh, try to get the most uh, out of the arable land that was available. So they developed uh, higher yield crops, faster growing varieties of rice and other cereal crops, um, and tried to implement these new agricultural technologies in developing countries. So um, people were concerned about running out of uh, food, and they wanted to try to increase the production area per unit through things like um, irrigation systems, intensive use of fertilizers, and hybrid crops that were uh, more efficient. So in some ways this was quite efficient in increasing overall um, food throughout the world, but there were also a lot of problems associated with it as well. Only wealthy farmers could afford to buy the inputs that offered so many benefits from the screen revolution. So this increased uneven development. Um, this was also increased by uh, areas that had more resources available for irrigation. Um, you had the displacement of uh, farm workers because all of a sudden folks were using machines. Um, also, indigenous crops that had been uh, developed over time and grown locally had been extremely diverse and tailored to many different kinds of environmental conditions. Um, but the switch to growing only a few types of hybrid crops made farmers much more vulnerable to environmental disasters. Um, for example, if a farmer had gone into debt buying inputs like seed, fertilizer, and pesticides, then a drought that would destroy that year's crop might impoverish a whole family or incre create an inescapable cycle of debt. And that's one of the things that happened in India with the introduction of um, hybrid cotton. More than 6,000 farmers have committed suicide due to these cycles of debt they've gotten into um, from uh, environmental disasters. Um, so there's also an increase of environmental degradation and increased salination of the soil as irrigation is used and that water um, evaporates over time. So one of the activities you'll be doing this week is that green revolution game to kind of put you in a role-playing scenario of living as a farmer, trying to make decisions about how to use the resources that are available to you and to take care of uh, your family. And I just want to end here by looking at a picture of a family in India um, from the Hungry Planet series by Peter Mendel and what they would eat in a week. So we see a lot of different uh, fresh foods and vegetables on folks' table there in India.